Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Channel. My name is Sean Wen Gan. I'm a fifth year graduate student at MIT, and I work with Larry Gu. Today, I want to talk about the restricted projections to planes in R3. And first, let me introduce a classical result in the geometric measure theory. It is called the Maelstrom Projection Theorem. For theta in S1, which is the unit circle in R2, let L theta be the line in the direction theta. And we also use pi theta to denote the orthogonal projection onto L theta. And here is the statement of Maelstrom projection theorem. Let A be a subset of R2 with dimension A. Then we have that the Hausdorff dimension of pi theta of A equals minimum of one comma A for almost every theta in S1. So let's first look at this equation. We see that the right-hand side is always an upper bound of the left hand side. The reason is that pi theta of A is a subset of L theta, which is a line. So it has Hausdorff dimension less than one. So we notice that pi theta is a Lipschitz map. So the dimension of this set is less or equal to the dimension of A, which is A. And Malmstrom theorem says that this upper bound on the right-hand side is attained for almost every theta. And more generally, we can consider a stronger version, which is known as the exceptional set conjecture. So given a set A in R2 with dimension A, and we consider another parameter S, which is less than the minimum of one comma A, we define the S exceptional sets to be the set of directions thetas such that the Hausdorff dimension of pi theta of A is less than S. Then it is conjectured that the dimension of this exceptional set is less than the maximum of zero comma two S minus A. So let me talk about some partial results on this exceptional set conjecture. Let's recall the definition of the exceptional set, which are those directions theta such that pi theta of A has Hausdorff dimension less than S. The first result is just a trivial result which says that if we choose our parameter S here to be A over two, then this exceptional set has dimension zero. The second result is due to Kaufman. He proved that the exceptional set has cost of dimension less than S. And the third result is by Falconer. He proved that the dimension of this exceptional set is less than the maximum of zero and one plus S minus A. More recently, there have been some progress on this conjecture and they are all Ipsilon improvement results. So this result is by Bogan. He proved an epsilon improvement over this trivial estimate. So we see that in Bogan's result, he allows some small perturbation in the parameter here. And on the right hand side, it's also a small number epsilon, which depend on eta. And epsilon tends to zero as eta goes to zero. Another result is by Orpon and Schmerken. They proved an epsilon improvement 
over Hoffman type estimate. And I also want to mention a result in higher dimensions. Let me introduce some notations. Let G and M be the set of M dimensional spaces in Rn. And for M dimensional space V in this Grassmannian, we let pi V to be the orthogonal projection onto V. And for a set A in Rn, we denote the exceptional set using the same notation as in the R2 case. We define it to be the set of M dimensional space V such that the Hausdorff dimension of pi V A is less than S. And here's the theorem by Wei Kun He. He proved that for set A in Rn with dimension A, we have the following exceptional set estimate. And also in his results, we allow some small perturbation on those parameters. And here, eta is just a small number, and epsilon is also a small number depending on eta. And when eta goes to zero, epsilon also goes to zero. So we note that when we choose m equals one and n equals two, and this result is just Bogan's result in R2. So actually we can view first result as a higher dimensional generalization of Bogan's result. Now, let me introduce the restricted projection problems in R3. Let gamma be a non-degenerate curve in S2. Here S2 is the unit sphere in R3 and the non-degenerate condition means that the determinant of gamma, gamma prime, and gamma double prime is non-zero. And you can think of a model curve given by this formula. This is the intersection of the unit sphere with the cone. And we see that even a non-degenerate curve gamma, it give rise to a one parameter family of planes and one parameter family of lines more precisely for each theta. We let V theta to be the two dimensional plane that is orthogonal to the direction gamma theta. And we define pi theta to be the orthogonal projection onto V theta. Also, we let L theta be the line that's in the direction gamma theta, and rho theta to be the orthogonal projection onto L theta. It is a natural question to ask the behavior of the projection of a set A onto this one parameter family of planes or one parameter family of lines. And here is the conjecture made by Fassler and Orpen. It is conjectured that for set A in R3, the dimension of pi theta of A, so here pi theta of A is the orthogonal projection of A onto V theta. This equals the minimum of two n dimension of A for almost every theta. And there's also a conjecture for the line version the house of dimension of rho theta of A equals the minimum of one and dimension of A for almost every theta. This conjecture has recently been resolved and the part one was resolved by myself, Ming Guo, Larry Groove, Terence Harris, Dominic Maldek, and Hong Wang. And part two was resolved by Orkunen, Hamaki, and Vanieri for the model curve. And for general curve, it was resolved using different methods by two groups of people. And in the paper of Manabika Pramanik, Hong Ouyang, and Josh Dell, 
they used the incidence estimate for circles to prove the second conjecture. And in the paper of myself with Larry Good, Dominic Maldak, we used a similar method in the six people paper. And in this talk, I will focus on the model curve and I will show some key ideas in the proof of the first part, the restricted projections to planes. So before even the proof, let me introduce several examples. And you may have noticed that we assume gamma is a non-degenerate curve. And actually this condition is quite necessary. If gamma doesn't satisfy the non-degeneracy condition, then the conjecture may fail. So let me assume our gamma is a degenerate curve, which is given by this formula. So this is the unit circle in the x1, x2 plane. I will show that for this curve, the conjecture fails. We first see that for this curve, the one parameter family of planes, B theta, are those planes that are parallel to the x3 axis. And this one parameter family of lines, L theta, are those lines that are orthogonal to the x3 axis. And here is the example. We choose our set A to be the x1, x2 plane. So here, the red plane is our set A. It has dimension two. But we see that chi theta of A, which is the orthogonal projection of A onto V theta, it's just a line. So it has Hausdorff dimension one. And let's come back to this conjecture. So the left-hand side is one and the right-hand side is two. So that means this conjecture fails in this case. Let's talk about the second example. We choose our set A to be the X3 axis. It has Hausdorff dimension one. But we note that rho theta of A, which is the orthogonal projection of this red line onto L theta, it's just a single point, which is the origin. So it has Hausdorff dimension zero. And we see that the second part of the conjecture also fails in this case. And next, let me state our main theorem. And instead of proving the original conjecture, we actually prove the stronger version, which is the Falconer type exceptional set estimate. And let me uh, define this exceptional set to be the set of data such that the Hausdorff dimension of pi theta of A is less than S. And we prove this Falconer type bound. So in our proof, we used a key tool, which is the L6 decoupling inequality for the cone. So let me introduce the notation. Let gamma delta inverse be this truncated cone. It's at scale delta inverse. And we also remove the one half portion that's close to the origin. And we are interested in the one neighborhood of this truncated cone. And it can be covered by Planck's sigma of dimensions delta inverse times delta to the minus one half times one. So these blue Planck's are those sigma. And usually we call this covering and a canonical covering. And we will use this canonical covering in the L60 coupling. So here is our L60 coupling inequality due to Bogan Demeter. 
Suppose f sigma is a set of functions that is fine. The support of f sigma hat is contained in the Planck sigma. Then we have the following decoupling inequality. So roughly speaking, we can decouple the L6 norm of the sum of functions into pieces. So here it's the small L2 sum of the L6 norms. So let me talk about the main ideas in our proof. So first of all, we will reduce our original theorem into the following delta discretized version. So in the delta discretized version, we will deal with the delta balls and the delta tubes. So it's okay. So let me uh, state the, this proposition. Let A be a set of delta balls with cardinality delta to the minus A. So here you can think of this set A as a discretized version of the set A here. And delta here is just a small scale. And the exponent A here can be thought of as the Hausdorff dimension of set A. And we also have a set E, which is a delta separated subset of the zero one interval with cardinality delta to the minus T. So you can think of this set E as a delta discretized version of the exceptional set here. And here the exponent T is the dimension of the exceptional set. And we have a set of delta tubes T theta. And these tubes are parallel to the direction gamma theta and they cover A. And these tubes have cardinality less than delta to the S. So the upper bound here can be thought of as that the dimension of the projection is less than S. Also, there's another assumption on the set of tubes T theta, which is called the known concentration condition. And in this talk, I'm not going to give the precise uh, definition for this known concentration condition. But I will just show you a picture here. These orange tubes are those delta tubes in T theta. And let's draw a fat blue tube here. The known concentration condition means that these orange tubes cannot fully fill in this blue fat tube, which means that there are many gaps here inside. Okay, so assuming these assumptions, we have this following estimate, which roughly speaking is that T is less than one plus S minus A. So roughly speaking, it's an discrete analog of the statement here. Okay, so let me summarize all the assumptions in the proposition. We have a set A, which consists of delta balls. So let me use red balls to denote those delta balls in A. It has cardinality delta to the minus A. And we also have a set of directions. So these are the directions. And in this picture, I only draw three directions. And the cardinality of the directions is delta to the minus t. And for each direction theta, we have set of tubes t theta. It has cardinality less than delta to the minus s. And also t theta satisfies the non-concentration non condition. And our goal is to show some relationship between those parameters A, T, S. And actually we will prove that T is less than one plus S minus A. So our tool is from the Fourier analysis. 
So let me state the idea. So here we have a set of tubes. So for each tube T in T theta, let a function phi T to be a smooth bump function adapted to T. So you can think of phi T as a characteristic function of T and it decays rapidly outside T. Also, it satisfies that phi T hat is supported in P theta. P theta is the dual rectangle of each tube T in T theta. So here is the picture. Our tube T has dimension delta times delta times one. And our P theta, the dual rectangle, has dimensions delta inverse times delta inverse times one. And we define F theta to be the sum of uh, T in T theta by T. So the support of F theta hat is contained in P theta. And for our proof, we want to study the sum of this F theta. Okay. And the first thing we need to do is to do the frequency decomposition for our slab P theta. So notice that our function F theta has Fourier transform supported in P theta. So we will decompose P theta into several regions and we will analyze them separately. So here is our slab P theta. It has orthogonal, it has normal direction gamma theta. And I also marked two important directions. One is gamma prime and another is gamma probes product gamma prime. So first, let me define P theta low, which is the region at this part. It's lie on the center of the slab. It has dimensions one times K inverse delta inverse times K inverse delta inverse. And let's also look at the regions on the two sides and let me define it to be P theta high. And we see that P theta high are away from the origin. And later we will show that when theta changes, those P theta highs are essentially disjoint. So now we still have two regions and one particularly interesting region is those lie on the middle and we call it F theta, P theta middle. It has dimension one times delta to the minus one half times delta inverse. So here is the P theta middle. And we still have the remaining regions, but in this talk, I'm not going to deal with them. So let me just focus on the low part, high part and the middle part. And let me define F theta low, F theta high, F theta middle to be the frequency projections of F theta to the corresponding regions. So here is roughly the geometry of our high part and the middle parts. So here I draw a cone, it's at scale delta inverse. And this blue slab is our P theta. And since our P theta forms a 45 degree angle with the X3 axis, so we see that P theta is tangent to this cone along a light ray direction. Okay. And the first observation is that our high part are finitely overlapping. To see this, let me consider this gray plane on the top. And I want to study the intersection of the P thetas with this gray plane. So here is our slice. The circle here is the intersection of the cone with this gray plane. 
it has radius delta inverse. And we have two tubes that are tangent to this circle. These two tubes are the intersections of P theta and another P theta prime with this gray plane. And the shadowed regions on the two ends are the high part here. So here the green shadowed regions are the high parts. And from this picture, we see that when theta changes, those parts on the two ends are essentially disjoint. So this gives the first observation. And the second observation is for the middle parts. When theta minus theta prime is less than delta to the one half, then P theta middle and P theta prime middle are essentially the same. So it's given by this picture. We have two slabs P theta and P theta prime. And when theta and theta prime is very close, then the middle part here, lying on the center, are essentially the same. And when theta minus theta prime is bigger than delta to the one half, then it's given by this picture. The middle parts are essentially disjoint. So we see that delta to the one half is the threshold for those middle parts to being whether essentially the same or essentially disjoint. Another key observation is that our middle part here is essentially one of the plank in the canonical decomposition for the cone decoupling. So let me remind you our plank in the canonical covering here. Those are the planks that are used for the decoupling quality. And we see that our red plank, which is the middle part, is just one of those planks. So that means for the middle part, we can use the decoupling inequality. So here is our final proof. We are interested in the sum of F theta for X on set A. First of all, we see that this sum is bigger than the cardinality of E. The reason is that the sum of F theta and you think of roughly as the sum of those tubes. And for each point in A, which is the red ball, we see that for every direction in E, there is a tube in that direction that passed through the red ball. So that means sum of F theta evaluated at the red balls is bigger than the cardinality of E. And by triangle inequality, it's bounded by the low part, high part, and the middle part. So we have three cases on whether low part or high part or middle part dominates. The first case is the low case, but actually we'll show that the low part will never dominate. So that means F theta low, so the low term, is much smaller than delta to the minus t, much smaller than here. And this is proved by using the known concentration condition of t theta. I'm not going to talk about the details here. So let me move to the high case. Suppose for most x, the high part is bigger than delta to the minus t. Then we can use the disjointness of the support of high F theta high hat. And then we can use the L2 inequality. And, and for the estimate here, we can also see the details in our paper. And the third case is the middle part dominant case, which means for most X in A, this middle part is bigger than delta to the minus t. And for this case, we use the bogan demeter's decoupling inequality for the middle parts. And again, you can find the details in our paper. Okay. So 
that's all for my talk. Thanks for looking the video.